Greetings and welcome to Enjoy Your Legacy. I am Teresa Martin and on today's segment, we're actually gonna be talking about this thing called finances, specifically credit and how credit works with your finances. So many people talk to me about why can I, how can I get out of debt? And one of the things I want to focus on with you today is I want to find out from you. You may be sitting home and saying, I can't talk about finances. I can't talk about financially free. I am so high in debt. I want you to know that if you are breathing, you can get out of debt. You can deal with your finances. We're going to talk about financial security to start. What is this thing called financial security? Financial security is a simple concept. It means that you are now working and the income that you are making is enough to cover your expenses. So it's not enough to exceed your expenses. However, it covers your expenses. So when you get your paycheck, what does that mean? That means that your mortgage are paid or your rent is paid. You can pay your cable bill, your cell phone bill, but well, we're not really going to be talking about that because we're going to talk about that a little later. However, that is all paid. Then once we have that covered, now we can focus on this thing called Called financial freedom and financial freedom means that you have income exceeding your expenses that means you have a little extra oomph out there that you can actually take that residual and now you can put that towards some wealth building strategies we're going to talk about that a little later as well and then we come to the granddaddy of them all that's actually talking about wealth building. That's talking about financial independence. That's when your money is actually going out every day with a little suitcase and going out to work when you work. So now this thing called earn income. Earn income is a dramatic experience because that is when you are trading your hours for dollars. You're not making a little bit extra. You go to work, you get paid, and that's earn income. However, when you stop working, what happens? that earned income stops. We don't want you to be living in the earned income phase. We need you to jump from earned income into that thing called residual income and passive income. However, don't jump too fast because we do need that earned income to make sure that we do what? cover those expenses. So that's why it's important to focus on earned income first before we start jumping into these things called residual income or financial independence. So that's where I want us to focus right now. So now, do you have income? Do you have severe debt? Well, let's focus on that a little bit more. So now you have a job. You have expenses, we all do, we live in America. So you're sitting home to say, I have a job, but I can't make ends meet. Well, ends don't meet, that's why they call ends, right? So let's just now focus on the important things about this taboo topic called credit. I know what you're saying, my credit is messed up. Well, let me let you know that first we have to understand what credit actually is. This thing called credit is very important. So let's spend a little bit of time focused on credit. There are five components that you must understand when it comes to credit. Payment history, big one. 35% of your credit score is based on your payment history. What does that mean? I haven't paid my bills on time, so now my credit is suffering. 35% huge amount of money and time and resources must be spent on this thing called payment history. If we pay our bills on time, we have a great payment history. If we had a little bump along the road, we all had them, but now we need to make sure that we repair that, okay? So let's spend some time on payment history. The second thing is, credit utilization. How are we actually using this thing called credit? That means 30% of your credit score is based on payment, payment utilization, okay? So first we talked about payment history. Now we're talking about payment utilization, which means balance is owed. So let's just say you have a thousand dollar credit card. If you are 30% at that credit minimum, okay, you are now over utilizing your credit, 
Okay, so what we want is if you have a credit limit of $1,000, we want to keep that balance owed at under $300. Okay, if you're at that threshold, now we can start really repairing our credit or making sure that our credit is where it needs to be. 15% of the credit score, that is very important I want you to focus on because 15% of your credit score is what? Length of credit. Now this is the big thing. If you're like me and so many other people, you're sitting out there, you probably got your first card when you was at college. Yeah, we went to college and then you had all the Visa and MasterCard tables there and they're gonna give you a MasterCard and a Visa. You don't have a job, you're just in college, but you're gonna get your credit card. Okay, so now we just started college and now we're in debt, but anyway, I digress. So let's talk about length of credit. That card that you got when you were in college, that's going to be worth more to you for your credit score than the one that you just got last week, last month, six months ago. So 15% of your credit score is based on length of credit, the long term that you had that credit. Okay. And then 10% is new credit. They're looking at how you are now going out to get credit. They want to see that, okay, I have new credit and I have old credit and now that's a little bit of a mixture. If you are now out there shopping and getting all these credit cards, uh-uh, bad thing, okay? They're looking at that. Something might be wrong. Why are you trying to get all this credit? So when people go out there and they're going to Macy's and they're going to JC Penney's and they're going to Bergdorf's and all these different places, they're actually looking at what you are doing with all of this new credit, okay? And the last thing, which is very important, that's 10% of your credit score, that's focused on the credit mix. You want to make sure that you just don't have a student loan or a mortgage. You want to make sure you have some revolving credit and some gas cards and some, you know, store cards like JCPenney's or Macy's. That is a whole mix on how you utilize, how you pay, how long you've had your credit, and that makes up your credit profile. Remember, your social security number is how they find you, but your credit score is how they define you. So you want to make sure that you have the best score out there. And if there are any errors on your credit report, that is when you want to fix them because your report, your profile has to be important for you because this has to do with how you are viewed. And if you can't get the proper credit score, we can't move into residual income. We can't move into wealth building because these are some of the things that are the foundation for that. Okay. So I want to make sure we got that clear. So one of the things that I do want us to focus on, let's look at the big picture. So we now we focused on our credit score. Now what do we need to do? Before you move into this thing called residual income, I want to make sure that you also have an emergency fund. Why is the emergency fund important? Because Murphy will come to you and bring his cousins, dumb, deaf, and stupid, Okay, and they will move into your house and they won't leave. So one of the things we want to focus on is getting that emergency fund because the car will break down. You will need new tires. The boiler will need to be repaired and the roof may need to be repaired. You don't want to take that away from your savings. You want to have a foreseeable plan that if something happens, we now can take care of that. So now I know you're sitting on the couch. I know you're looking at me and you're saying, I can't even pay my bills. How am I going to create an emergency fund? Well, let me tell you, Macy's shouldn't get paid before you do. Okay. You pay yourself first. Always remember that. Okay. So it's God and you and then everything else. So now let's talk about the emergency fund. So we're going to talk about now $500 minimum. I want you to focus on a thousand. Okay. That may be difficult depending on where you are, you know, in your financial walk, but the minimum is $500 because some things can be paid for with $500 and you won't have to, you know, break into your savings account. So if we can just really sacrifice a little sacrifice and don't pay a little extra to your bills until you have an emergency fund set up, because if you pay all your bills, and at the end of that, something happens, what's going to happen? You might need to take that credit card again and do what? Take care of the emergency that happened. This won't happen if we actually have that emergency fund. So we definitely want to make sure we put an emergency 
emergency fund in place first. So you're sitting there, you're saying, I don't have any money. So what do we do? We talk about some income generation things. Now, look at the things that we can do. We can now stop spending, limit your spending. If you're looking at this and you have a DVD player, great, because I want you to hear me and I want you to get this lesson. However, if you actually have multiple cars, do you really need two cars? Maybe not. OK, if you have a spouse and, you know, you have a car, what you want to probably focus on is you probably want to focus on, hmm, maybe I can get up 10 minutes early, 15 minutes early and we can share a car or we can carpool or something like that. What with the money that you can either sell that car or you can actually now save money in gas, maintenance and things on that other car. What can we do? We can now buy down debt. We can build up that emergency fund. We can do so many other things with that. So multiple cars, think about that. Do I really need two cars? Okay. The second thing is, what about the cell phone? Okay, cell phone, landlines, all these different things. Maybe you do need a cell phone because if you have children and things of that sort, you may need a cell phone because now cell phones are sometimes not a luxury, it is a necessity. So one of the things I wanna ask you is, if you do have a cell phone, do you really need all the apps and all the features and all those things on the cell phone? Because if you're paying $79, $99, $100 and something dollars, now we have to start limiting what it is that we're using the cell phone for, okay? So maybe some of those things. And now we're, since we're on the topic of cell phones, let's talk about internet. Let's talk about, you know, cable. And let's talk about all these different things that are now come into our lives and now are time wasters. How much, do you, how much time do you spend on the internet? How much time do you spend on television? There's a reason why most successful people do not even own a television set. Why is that? Because they spend their time not on time wasters, but on income generators. And that's what I want you to focus your time on. So if you're sitting here and you're watching me, what I want you to focus on is in my mind, I wanna say, with this time that I spend watching all these different shows, that's time that I can actually put a business plan together and try to figure out how I can earn some extra money. Yeah, guys, if it, you're watching me, don't care about what the Jets are doing, don't care about what the Lakers are doing, don't care about any of that. Those are millionaires running around making their money and you're sitting there not making a dime, but you're watching them rah, 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 sis, mumba. I'm telling you, be your own cheerleader, Put a plan together and now we can focus on tackling this debt, okay? So the next thing I wanna to talk to you about is when we talk about limiting your spending, now we're gonna talk about creating that budget. I don't like the B word, but we're gonna use the B word just for now, just so I can tell you what it is. A budget is just actually a cash flow plan. You are directing your cash as to where you want it to go as opposed to your cash telling you where it's going, okay? So what we wanna focus on is we wanna now focus on a cash flow plan. And we want to be very specific on where our dollars go. Every dollar has a destination and you decide where that destination is. That is what a cash flow plan does for you. That is what a budget can do for you. Now, the big D of it all, debt. I have so much debt. What am I going to do? We're going to take care of that. We're going to eliminate that. We're not going to talk about anything moving forward about building wealth until we deal with this thing called debt. I know people tell you good debt versus bad debt. Debt, debt, debt. We're going to snowball that debt down. There's two ways we can actually focus on debt. We can either focus on paying off that high interest credit card first, or we can focus on paying off the lowest balance first. Now, both work. But one thing is when you pay off your high interest rate, the one thing that that does, that helps you financially. When you do the low balance, that helps you psychologically. It makes you feel as though I'm actually tackling this thing. I'm actually doing this thing. So I always like to do the small balances first because it makes me feel a little bit accomplished. Now that you have this whole thing called credit, you're working on this debt now and only now will we start working on residual income. OK, and when we talk about residual income, we're going to be talking about that a little bit more in our wealth series. But what I want you to know is that we're going to be talking about four basic aspects of passive income, residual income. We're going to talk about real estate, rental real estate specifically. We want to make sure that we're leveraging our house and our tenants to buy off our 
debt because that's good debt. Okay. Then we have business. Why business? If you are self-employed, you are not a business owner. If you are actually doing the work, you just now fired your boss and got a crazier boss yourself. Okay. So that's all that is because if you stop working in a hairdresser or hair salon, if you stop, you know, like me being an attorney, if you don't take any cases, you're unemployed, but a business owner, they invest their time, energy, money into a system where they leverage other people's knowledge, skills, and talent. And when they're off in Jamaica, paychecks are coming. We call that mailbox checks. That's what we want you to have. So we want you to get a business so that you can now have this thing called mailbox checks. I'm telling you, it's a great feeling to come off the plane and know that you got a check waiting for you, okay? So the other thing is, other investments. That's your 401k. That is investing in something like the stock market or things of that sort. And you're getting dividends. We're not talking about just the dividends. You're living off the interest while your principal is still growing. So that's other investments. And the last thing is intellectual property. Okay. Are you an author? Everyone has a book inside them. Everyone wants to tell their story. So why not write your little story down or write your memoir down and then put it on Amazon and let people click and that also can be mailbox checks, okay? Or if you're a software developer or you wanna give a license to something, that's also residual income. So we wanna make sure that we understand that residual income is making a one-time investment of time, energy, or money, and then having that grow over and over and over again, which is residual. And then we talk about this thing called portfolio income. Man, oh man. This is the big daddy of it all, because this is what I told you. Remember I told you about financial independence, portfolio income. That's when your money is going out with little suitcases and making money for you. So land. So now you're going to purchase a piece of land and then that land is going to develop and then you can sell that off right? Or you have a mobile home park or something like that. That's portfolio income. Well, the stock market also acts as more like a hybrid between a, uh, residual income because you're throwing off dividends, but also it's actually portfolio income because it's earning money on the money. So that's very, very important. And that's where all the wealth builders live. They live in the land of residual income and portfolio income. So that's where I want everyone to be. So with this segment, I really wanted you to sit and get to know me, understand about how you can enjoy your legacy. I want you to understand that when you tackle your, your thing called credit, you also tackle earn income, understand how you get residual income, understand that we need portfolio income to actually build wealth. Now you are on the road to enjoying your legacy. So this segment was so important for me. I am super excited that you took the time to join me, but this is only beginning. So what I want to ask everyone to do is really take a snapshot of what it is that you have right now because I want to be able to help everyone right now from the comfort of their own living room to start this thing called legacy building so thank you so much it was my pleasure and I'll see you on the next segment there was a gentleman and this gentleman worked very very hard for his family he worked 90, 95 hours a week. He traveled all over the world. He actually provided for his family with a big giant house, all the cars, all the toys that they can possibly want. One day he came home in the middle of the night and his son actually woke up in the middle of the night and he came downstairs and he had a bad dream and he went to the man that he saw standing in the living room. He said, excuse me, sir, but I want my dad. And do you know who my dad is? And the gentleman just looked at him and he said, I am your dad. And the little boy said, no, no, you're not my dad. And then the man looked around, he looked at his son and he started tearing up. And he started tearing up because he started looking at all the wonderful things that he has provided for his family. And then he looked at his son, and yet his son didn't know who he was. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. 
I am Teresa Martin again, and this segment is about personal development and why personal development is so good for your health, for your wealth, for your livelihood, the connections that's important that we maintain. So sit back and enjoy as I talk to you about personal development. First, I want to talk to you about relationships, the importance of relationships. Now, we're talking about all different kinds of relationships, relationships with your coworkers, your boss, your significant other, your spouse, your children. These are all people that affect our daily walks. These are also people who are or may be our legacy our heirs, we need to make sure that we develop proper relationship with them. One of the things that I do know, and you probably have experience in this too, what about children? How is your relationship with your children? If you're not, you know, with child, you don't have any children, what about your nieces, your, your, your younger um, millennials is what we call them, you know, up to 34 years of age. How is your relationship with them? Let's take some time to talk about the importance of building a relationship with the millennials, the next generation. The reason why this is important is because they're mockers. OK, they mock everything that we do. They mock everything that we see. And so everything that you do to instill relationships and, 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 and principles and things of that sort in your relationships, that actually goes a long way. So now children. I developed a long time ago with my children. I'm not going to go back how long because I don't want to tell my age. However, a long time ago, we sat around the table and we had something called family night. And this was the best time for my children. I have two. And this is the best time for my children because this is the one time that they get to say what's wrong with me, what's wrong with mommy and what they didn't like. I wanted to have this forum because my father did it with me, my mom did it with me, and this was a time where, you know, as parents we make mistakes and we don't know really how it affects our children. So we sat around the table and everyone had a turn. What they didn't like, what they did like, what needs to be changed. But the one thing that we did that I encourage everyone that they should do is developing that relationship with money. I did that with my children. My children did not earn allowances. My children earned commissions. OK, I changed my children's mindset because I didn't want them to think that you just get something without working for it. The world is changing and we are moving more into a get paid for what you do mentality. So I wanted to change my children's mindset a long time ago. Now they understand what I meant. So relationships with your children are very, very important. Don't hide things from your children. If you don't have enough money to pay for certain things, sit your children down. Down, give them the budget let them find a way if they want sneakers give them a way out to say if you find money in this budget we can buy what it is that you need to buy because they need to know the relationship between money and finances and that's important also our spouses please do not hide things from your spouse. If you want the golf clubs, talk to your spouse about the golf clubs. Do not bust your budget based on things that you want but may not need because this can damage a relationship. When you're dating, this is very important. You know, when I started dating my, my current fiance, the first thing that I wanted to know is, what's your credit like? <laughs> I wanted to know, actually, you know, how you handle your relationship with your creditors. OK, that was important to me. And his relationship with his mother was important to me, because if he had a great relationship with his mother, that meant that he knew how to take care and treat a woman. And that's one of the things that I always found very, very attractive in people. So spouses take time talk about the big important things in life and the one thing that i'm going to encourage everyone that's listening to the sound of my voice date night date night is very very important don't get too busy where you don't take the time to show the people who are very important to you that you care date night is very important and i'm not just talking about a date night with your significant other or your spouse i'm talking ladies date night for yourself you know draw the tub put out the candles, whatever you like, a good book, 
date yourself because you are important and you need to take care of yourself because if you put yourself into the picture, now someone knows how they can also treat you relationships, whether we're talking about a spousal relationship, significant others, co-workers, children, very, very important that we make sure that the people who are in our lives know that we love, care, and respect them. Relationships. Now we're going to talk about health. Health. This is so near and dear to me, and I'm hoping <laughs> that I don't tear up because the reason why health is so near and dear to me is that I know so many people in my life work hard, hard workers, and they are now struggling with health issues from lupus, high blood pressure to sugar diabetes. And you know, we call it sugar diabetes. You know, most people just call it diabetes. So you know my culture. So, you know, it's very, very important that we understand that we have to take care of ourselves. We can't work ourselves into the grave. If you are within the sound of my voice and amongst the land of the living, it's important that you understand that you need to treat yourself with the respect and the temple in which you have. You were entrusted with this body that you have and you need to treat that body with such respect that no toxic no toxins can enter that body i'm talking about from your language you know don't talk deaf talk okay all this i don't feel well i don't i feel sick and all these other kind of elements that you allow to enter into your atmosphere what i'm telling you is to speak life okay when you start saying rich you have to smile, right? But when you say debt and budget and, and all these different things, you know, your face frowns up and things of that sort, you're doing something internally. So there is power in the tongue. So we want to make sure that we start with our little health talk by actually giving us some positive self-talk. Okay, I am beautiful. I am worthy. I am rich. My father is a king. I am a queen. All these different things just start el just elating into your, your world and you just start beaming up because it's so very important. The one thing that I want to tell you, take time to go work out. I don't care if you don't have any money to go to a gym. I have paid so much money to a gym. I've probably seen it five times this year, okay? So I'm not telling you to go waste money and go to a gym, walk, okay? Instead of running for, you know, the bus or taking the bus somewhere, if it's 10 blocks, walk, leave a little earlier, just start walking, drinking more water, you know, doing all the things that we know to be true, but we just don't want to do it. I know the juices taste good and the sugars are very, very, you know, tempting. However, water, drink a lot of water, it's good for our skin, it's good that we re replenish ourselves. And also, I'm going to say something a little tricky. Don't say negative things around your water because your water has life. Okay? So I do want to make sure that you eliminate the negative talk. Just start talking to yourself. I am worthy. I am beautiful. All those things that I just mentioned. Because the one thing that I want you to know is that your atmosphere changes. Things start shaking when you start paying attention to the things that's most important. Because if you fail in your finances, if you fail in your marriage, if you fail in things in life on your job, you get fired. What is the first thing that you think about? Either sleeping too much, going out to eat something unhealthy, you know, doing the ice cream binges and all these different things. It's all psychological. It's a trick. I want you to understand that your relationships and your health are definitely tied to your wealth. So if you understand those things, we can now start turning things around because you can't work if you're not well. You can't pay your creditors if you're not well. You can't leave a legacy if you're not well. So health is very important when we're talking about this thing called personal development. It's personal and it's your development. And we really, really have to focus on that. The last thing that I really want to talk about is faith. I don't care what you say, what you do, where your faith is, your money will be also. And you have to make sure that you're putting your trust into the things that actually are for the betterment of your good and not just your good, the good of your legacy, your heirship. Because my goal is to, you know, retire one generation up and five generations down. That's generational wealth. 
if you are financially free, but your children's children's children are not financially free, then you haven't done your job. Because what I've learned is that it's a good man and woman that leaves an inheritance for his children's children. That is the best word that I have ever heard. That's why I named my company Generational Wealth Zone on Proverbs 13, 22. I think that everyone should work very, very hard to leave a legacy and generational wealth and break the chains of generational poverty. You do that by becoming a good steward of your time, your resources, and your money. And we start by understanding that there are so many principles. I don't care who your higher power is. What I'm telling you is that there is something greater than you. And that is the legacy in which you're going to leave behind. So if all you're focused on is buying down debt and not creating a legacy for your children and leaving a blueprint, a roadmap on how you did it, what you're setting yourself up for is if you leave wealth, and you leave it to someone, how long do you believe it will still be there if you are no longer there to direct it? We need to leave those legacies. We have to have faith in the things that we entrust ourselves to and the things that we believe in, because I'm telling you, without faith, nothing is going to be possible. You have to believe that you can do it. You have to believe that you are worthy. You have to believe that you have the ability to change your life, the, your children's lives, and the ones who are coming after. You have the power. You have the faith. It is you. If it's not you, then who? If it's not now, then when? I'm asking you, do you want to change your legacy? If you do, you have to get onto the road of personal development. It starts with the man or the woman in the mirror. I want to thank you for joining me on this segment. This is a touchy topic for me because personal development is so important. We spend so much time playing the game, the blame game, and we are not taking enough time to look at the man in the, or the woman in the mirror. But it starts with us. We have the power within us to change so many things. It starts with us. So I'm asking you, join me on this journey of enjoying your legacy, personal development, and I will see you on the next segment. I wanna tell you a story. I wanna tell you a story about three individuals. We have a doctor. She earns $250,000 a year. She did the best she could do in school. She got good grades and she landed that perfect job. We have the contractor. He works for himself. He's self-employed and he actually has land worth a million dollars. And then you have a school teacher. She earns $40,000 a year. She has 10 properties throwing off residual income of $3,800 a year. Now, in your opinion, we have the doctor who's $250,000 a year. We have the contractor who's $86,000 a year. And you have the school teacher who's $40,000 a year. In your opinion, who's the most financially free? Well, a lot of people would choose the doctor. Now, let's just review that. The doctor, she's in earned income. Okay, she has a lot of assets, she has a great lifestyle, she earns a whole lot of money, she's technically very rich. But like me, maybe you know a lot of rich, broke people. So let's talk about the contractor. He has $86,000 in income, he has a piece of land that he can throw off a million dollars. However, in order for him to utilize that land, he actually has to convert that into cash flow. OK, so we have to sell it. We have to get a buyer. And what if I say it's only worth two hundred thousand dollars and that's all I'm willing to pay. So technically, maybe he will not be a net worth millionaire. But you have the school teacher and she actually has forty thousand dollars a year in income. She has ten rental properties that's throwing off thirty eight hundred dollars a year. I'm sorry, thirty eight hundred dollars a month, which is giving her forty five thousand dollars a year. What is that? She now is throwing off. $45,000 a year as opposed to her $40,000 a year job. So who, in your opinion, is the most financially free? I would venture to say the school teacher because she now is working because she wants to, not because she has to. And that's the difference with financial freedom. So that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk to you about financial freedom and legacy building. 
I'm going to talk to you about creating wealth, managing wealth, and protecting that wealth once we get it. So now let's review. We want to talk about residual income. Remember we talked about the doctor. What is that? Earned income. If she stopped working, would she still have the lifestyle that she's keeping up now? I venture to say no. So don't worry about trying to go out, get a great, great job, make a whole lot of money because what you're doing is trading those hours for dollars. Once you stop working, your income will stop. So we have to do something else. What about talking about residual income where we talked about the real estate, where you have rental properties. Remember the school teacher, 10 rental properties throwing off $3,800 a month. That's giving her $45,000 in annual income. I know you like me would like to have that type of residual income. What about a business owner? Now we have the contractor. We said that he worked for himself. He's earning $86,000 a year, but he's self-employed because he's actually out there working. So he's self-employed, but he also has raw land that was worth a million dollars, but he had no residual income. So when we have a business, we want to make sure that we're generating residual passive income. Okay. And we also have other investments. That's our 401ks, our IRAs, our stock market investments. These are things that's actually we're putting money in, but it's throwing off more money. Return on that investment. And lastly, we had intellectual property. Intellectual property is when I mentioned to you before, when we talked about everyone has a book inside them, write a book one time and now you market it and you put it on Amazon and every time someone clicks, you get paid. We call that mailbox money. So these are some of the things that throws off residual income. So if you want to be like the school teacher, you want to have residual income working in the backdrop while you may be working your job, but you have things working behind you. That's the way we create wealth by focusing on things that take away, don't take away our time and give us income. So that's creating your wealth. Now let's focus a little bit about managing the wealth once we create it. So we need to make sure we have mentors, coaches, people who are actually more seasoned, more experienced than we are about managing our wealth once we receive it. Now, don't make the mistake in turning over all the responsibility to anyone, you know, your financial planner, because no one actually has more invested in you than you. So who wants to, who wants to focus on managing your own wealth? No one. Who has to focus on managing your own wealth? You do. I do. Because no one cares about my money or your money more than you or I, right? So what we want to focus on now is hiring the right people to give us the right knowledge to educate ourselves so that we can make sure the monies that we are creating, we also now know how to manage it. So we want to understand the market creation. We want to understand how money works. We want to understand how it grows. We want to not only make the money, more importantly, we want to know how to keep it. So now let's focus on the important piece, protecting it. So now that we created it, now we know how to manage it. Now we want to know how to protect it. So I want to really delve in and I want to now talk about protecting wealth. This is very, very important because not too many people pay attention to this most important factor. So the first thing I want to talk about is to the business owners out there. You may have a business. OK, and I know, you know, you may say, oh, I have a business, but I don't have to deal with this thing called protecting wealth or estate planning. Yes, you do, because you must protect your assets. OK, and so one of the things that I want to tell you, if you're running a business and you're running a business outside of an LLC, which is a limited liability company, you are running the risk of now losing everything. So I want you to pay attention to LLCs. We want to focus on a limited liability 
company. And that's how you protect the assets within your business. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure I spoke to the business owner and you before I delved into the big concept, which is estate planning. Estate planning is so important. You have so many goals that you want to accomplish in estate planning. It's not just for the wealthy. And so many people make that mistake in thinking, oh, I don't have any money. I don't have any wealth. Why would I need to create an estate plan? Let me tell you. The first thing I want you to know is that if you don't have a plan, the state has one for you, okay? And if you actually have minor children and you do not create an estate plan or a will to protect your minor children, you are neglectful. And I'm talking to you and I'm hoping you're getting this because the only place that you can provide for your minor children is in a will. And you need to make sure that you have that lined up. Also, estate planning, if you have money, if you have wealth, this is a way that you can avoid taxes. Because guess what? If you don't leave it to your heirs, the state may get it. And who wants IRS in their pocket? I always tell people, when you work hard, you always have a silent partner. And that silent partner is the IRS. So one of the things that I want to make sure that we talk about and delve into is this thing called estate planning. So let's focus right now on the wills, okay? What is this thing called a will? It's your will. It's whatever you will to happen, you can put it into this document to protect yourself and make sure that everything that you want to happen, the distribution of your estate and your assets go to the places and the people that you want it to go to. The one thing that I always tell people is who, if you are in a position that you can't think for yourself, you're incapacitated, who has the ability to write the check, to pay the bills? You need to make sure that you have a health care power of attorney that makes sure that whatever you want to happen. So if you want, this is not a living, this is not a living will. This is actually a power, a health care power of attorney to make sure that your loved ones know what you want in the event that you can make a, a health care decision on your own. Also, we want to make sure that you have a financial power of attorney. Now, if you don't do this and you go into a coma or some other state of incapacitation, who do you want to write the check? Sometimes, you know, you might have family members that you don't want in your checking account or, or, or making financial decisions. You have the power right now to make a decision on who will be able to make those financial decisions on your behalf. Also, you want to make sure that you have a living trust. A living trust is a way that you actually can be, you know, in control of your assets beneath the grave. And it's a living, breathing document that you want to make sure that you put into place. And some of the things that people do not understand is that the living trust is so very important that it allows you to avoid probate. And we're going to delve into that a little bit deeper, but I also want to make sure that I mention about insurance. Why insurance? Now, for the big picture, Let's focus on the big picture of life insurance. There's so many different, you know, different um, animals out there. So you have term life and whole life and university life. How about I just get you to get some life insurance? Then we'll figure out all the different terms and all the different things that go, you know, go around life insurance. But the most important thing is who do you have in your life that you want to protect? That's what life insurance does. Whatever your income is, when you pass on, that income is now gone. So you want to make sure that you have insurance for your loved ones to make sure that they're able to take care of themselves and live in the lifestyle in which they're used to living. So these are so many um, important factors that I want you to take into consideration, but no one focuses on the importance of estate planning. It's bigger than just you. It's about your family. It's about your legacy. And these are some of the things that we definitely want to make sure that we take care of. Because if you love yourself, if you love your loved ones, these are the things that must happen, not should happen, not can happen, but must happen. You need to make sure that you focus on these things. Now, the trust, very important. I love living trust. Why? Because I tell my daughters, all the time. 
One of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in is making sure that you do the things that you're supposed to do, but that I expect you to do also. So if I want them to say, you get my money, if you jump on one foot, marry this guy I want you to marry, go to the school that I want you to go to, I can dictate that from my grave because I work too hard to just allow my children to just blow all my work out the window because they want to. So. I need to make sure that I'm controlling that thing called my trust because I trust in myself and I trust in them to do the right thing. But if they don't, I have a trustee that's in control of that to make sure that what I laid out is what's going to happen. But the best part about the living trust is the IRS is out of my pocket. The IRS is out of my pocket. So now I avoid probate because what a living trust does is Teresa Martin no longer owns the property or the assets. So what I do during my lifetime is I transfer all of my assets, all of my personal property into the trust. Now who owns the trust? Teresa Martin Trust owns the trust. So when I pass on, what do the creditors get? Teresa Martin owns nothing. So it was all transferred. You get the point? The point is that when you're alive, you make the decisions that will affect your legacy, your heirs. And one of the things that's important is that you have the power to do that. Don't think about not having enough money, not having enough wealth. You have to understand that don't think about today, think about tomorrow, because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. And remember, it's a good man or woman that leaves an inheritance for his children's children. That means knowledge. We have to instill knowledge. So everything that we do, remember I talked about the blueprint. We want to leave the legacy, the legacy of education, the importance of creating wealth, the importance of managing wealth, the importance of protecting wealth. It's not about how much money you make. It's how much money you keep. That's the most important aspect of building a legacy and being able to enjoy your legacy. I am so elated that you join me in the series of Enjoy Your Legacy. Why? Because you can create it. You can manifest it. You actually can protect it. And with all of that, you now have all the tools you need to enjoy your legacy. So get started, get ready right now, and do it.